So welcome. Oh. Welcome to my session. Thank you for choosing this session out of all the sessions at DrupalCon. Um, I always do this off the, off the beat talks about something philosophical. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, never, I'm never pulling like the big crowds. Uh, may, maybe, you know, in the future. Anyway, um, I want to talk to you about uh, complexity and about complicated systems and about what all of that means for the world that we're living in and how it's changing everything. And then seven models, uh, because you know, all good things come in sevens, maybe, um, that, uh, that can help you to apply that to, to real life uh, and how, how to make better businesses, better communities and so on. Um, but before I, I start, I'd like to say thank you. Um, uh, because, uh, and this is not the Drupal community, this is another community, but um, I'm now 14, Denise. yeah, Denise Cooper, yeah. So I, I've been 14 years in the Drupal community. This was my first real big community, and um, communities taught me so much, and um, that, um, uh, and this, like the Drupal community, right now, the inner sourcing community is one of them where I'm learning. So I'd like to say thank you to the communities that are teaching me this stuff, because without the community, I would be, um, you know, a lot more stupid. Uh, I, w I wouldn't know a lot of things. Um, I'd like to say thank you to my colleagues, because because of them, I can do the traveling that I'm doing. Uh, it's very easy to forget about the people that are um, making it possible for the people that are presenting. Um, I think. Uh, without them, I wouldn't be able to do all the traveling. I wouldn't be able to do all the learning that I'm doing. Uh, so I'd like to say thank you to them and to my family because uh, they've been missing me a week and a half now. And uh, they're somewhere in a museum today. Um, but <laughs> normally my daughter would have joined me, but in the end we decided to, uh, to do differently. Um, so now I'm sure you you didn't think that the, the word digital transformation was going to show up in the talk about culture and um, you know complexity, but there it is, digital transformation. I know I, I think it's kind of like a buzzword today, um, but I, I for me digital transformation has a lot to do with complexity, and uh, I'll explain you why. A little while ago, Forbes did this article about the Copernican Revolution. And there was this idea that um, somehow there's, it seems there's something changing in business. Uh, business is becoming more people-centric. Um, uh, like there's agile, there's uh, self-organizing teams, there's a lot of this stuff happening. And um, so there's like, hooray, you know, business is finally seeing the light and, and becoming more human. And when I, when I was looking at this, and I was like, well, yes, but I don't think it's because they want to be human. <laughs> I think there's a really good business reason for it. And, um, uh, and I think it's, it's actually about complexity. Uh, because, as I asked earlier, like, well, what is the difference between complicated and complex? It's kind of a mind bender, because for a very long time for me, these were two concepts that were the same. <laughs> um, but, uh, the way that the easiest way to understand is that uh, complicated systems are like cars and machines, like uh, clockworks. They're really, really efficient at doing what they're built for. Um, and um, uh, if there's an expert uh, about that machine, they can completely understand how it works. Uh, but as soon as you start changing a little bit in the environment, like if you drop that watch or if you put some potholes in the roads, um, they're very quickly break down. Like if you take one piece out of an engine of a car, it just it's game over. And um, uh, complex systems are like ecosystems, like uh, flocks of birds, like communities. Um, you can do a lot of really abusive things with complex systems, and they'll still keep on functioning uh, until a certain point. And um, what my postulation, like my core concept, what I'm starting from is that we've been building businesses and governments and like pretty much everything, like complicated machines for efficiency for all of our lives, all, th all since the, the Industrial Revolution. This has been the big way that we do things. We build complicated systems, we create processes, 
where we put people in a little box where you know you have to do exactly as I tell you what to do and uh, and that's no longer working because the environment has changed uh, because um, what we used to do like we used to have an environment that was fairly stable um, yeah new things came up once in a while um, but it took enough time Com companies were slowly adapting um, and you, you, you had time to change your processes and your procedures to adjust to whatever was coming up. But now, all bets are off. Um, the world has become so much more interconnected that um, the m massive increase of interconnection is increased the complexity of our environment so much that these complicated machines no longer work. These large enterprise companies that were built you know, with this very hierarchical structures um, with these very strict procedures where it takes a year, year and a half, two years to change vendors. All of this stuff is just too slow. And, um, and the world needs to adapt because, like, you know, it's, it's just a lot more complex. And so in what I want to go through in this presentation is through seven areas where you can see the fault lines of these systematic failures in complex uh, systems, uh, complicated systems, where you can start to see that complex, complex interactions are changing the way things work. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll talk, talk about seven fault lines, and then a bunch of books that I've read that like help me to see the world this way. Um, these are two of them. Um, thinking in systems um, is a, an interesting primer to systems thinking. I, have you heard of systems thinking before? Some people? Okay. Um, it's like um, most of the time, so I, I don't like Disney movies because they're so black and white. So my kids, uh, they started uh, watch their first movies were Ghibli um, uh, from uh, Miyazaki. Um, there were movies that were talking about, yeah, they're doing awful things, but there's a lot of reasons why they're doing awful things. And, you have to look at the whole thing and don't don't just say like oh they're evil destroy them um so i think that that was um yeah, that's an interesting book to look at the other one is understanding complexity uh, it's a new new book that i just read um it talks about how to to uh how to actually drive complex complex behavior like what makes systems become complex very very interesting and exciting okay so complexity so why are companies struggling? I think I already gave it away a little bit in what I was describing earlier. Um, I think the key thing that I want to highlight here, if, if you're into self-organizing teams, two books on the right are very interesting. Uh, the middle one is why you should think about self-organizing teams. The one on the right is how. So if, you're, if you heard about self-organizing teams and restructuring your business as a self-organizing team, Brave New Work is, is probably uh, the, the way to go if you, if you want to do it. Uh, the other one is, is more the, the kind of like the why. But this first one talks a little bit about uh, boundaries and, um, and, like, and how to restructure and why to restructure the organization. Because traditional companies are structured like hierarchies um, where there's a hierarchy of leadership and the leadership is doing all the thinking and the people on the bottom are doing all the execution. And the leadership decides what has to be done, and the people on the bottom, they just execute. And uh, the problem with this is that you have a signal cascade that you need to follow. And, and it's just too slow. Because by the time the leadership has learned the way the environment has changed, the environment has changed again. <laughs> and, um, and now they're optimizing for the wrong environment. So, and and um, the uh, Organizing for Complexity book, they talk about how um, you should be structuring your organizations more like uh, an interface with the environment, where you try to have all of your, like where the people that are interacting with customers, the people that are interacting with uh, the environment where things are changing, that they are doing the learning and you're trying to learn from that and change your behavior as a system based on that. So that instead of being like an oil tanker that's just has this massive mass and it can't turn, <laughs> you become like a, more like a hive that is really adaptive and that can adjust uh, in mid-course and change the way that it's doing things. So I think 
the core, the core thing is that if you want to thrive in this new way of doing things, you have to be a complex adaptive system. Uh, have you heard of complex adaptive systems before? Okay. Wow, great. <laughs> so, um, complex adaptive systems, it's, it's, a, it's a whole science about systems that are behaving, that, that are based on agents, that are interconnected, and that are collaborating. I'll have a, a few slides at the end of my talk where I talk a little bit more about like how you structure that and how that works. But the, the interesting thing is that organizations have always been complex adaptive systems. It's very, I'm doing the black and white thing. I'm doing the Disney thing. Um, it's not that black and white. We, we've always been somewhat adaptive. Uh, I think where you can find complex adaptiveness in current uh, organizations is in culture. So when people talk about culture beat strategy every time, that's what they're talking about. Uh, I think what we need to do now is to make uh, our organizations even more complex adaptive and create more space for people to do that behavior that helps us to adjust to changing environments. Next is motivation. Um, why do we do what we're doing? Why, as a community, are we contributing to open source voluntarily? Um, this is one of the things that I'm a little bit afraid with some of the decisions that I've made in the Drupal community, but um, basically we've had this, we, we have this magical thing, right, as a Drupal community. Um, we have, well, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, we've built a whole lot of people, probably hundreds of thousands of people that are interacting with us, uh, uh, using our tools, uh, contributing back to some extent, just sometimes in very small ways, uh, by being present in our communities, by, by doing stuff. Um, and, and all of that, for the most part, is voluntary. Uh, we have so many camps happening that are for free, that are, you know, just give people a place to be together and, and, and share what they know and, 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 you know, be community together. And, um, and if you think about that, that's kind of, that doesn't fit the standard economical model, right? In the standard economical model, the whole idea is like, you have a transaction and I've got something, you've got something and you know, we, we, need to, we, uh, we need to give to each other somehow. And uh, so two books that really changed my perspective on all of this was uh, Drive and uh, Punish by Rewards. Um, I think Drive is kind of the, the basic model of um, extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. And I've added belonging in there in the middle. This uh, Katrina Novakovic, uh, who I met in the inner sourcing community, she talked about this, how they saw this at Red Hat as a driver for open source communities. But I think the, the core thing is, and I think you've all seen this model, right? The intrinsic versus ex extrinsic. Intrinsic is good, extrinsic is bad, um, to some extent, yeah. But um, that if you start giving people m extrinsic motivation rewards, then it starts reducing and eroding their intrinsic motivation. Now, uh, we all need money to survive. We all need uh, to make a living. Uh, I think there's ways to combine them. Uh, I think the, the, um, I, I, I like to think, of, I like the way Airbnb does it. You have the transaction that happens before the stay. So you, you order a room, you pay immediately. And by the time you have the experience, it's kind of forgotten that you've exchanged money. So you have the transaction happening separately from the intrinsic uh, parts where you're building community and you're, you know, when your host is giving you recommendations, yeah, maybe you're gonna give them a better review, but it's not, they're not gonna get paid for that. And that is helping to build uh, social capital. And um, yeah, and, and it's, a, it's a different way of, of interacting. So, but the, the core thing is, Motivation is not about sticks, it's also not about carrots. And that was for me the shocker. Like, um, punished by rewards, uh, recommend, highly recommend it. It talks about how actually giving rewards can be damaging. Like the whole, um, the whole bonus culture in the US is probably like one of the most 
crazy things <laughs> you can do if you, if you want to keep people motivated. Um, next is cooperation. Do you know this? Do you know where this is? It's a, an ant nest that collaborates with a plant. Uh, it's like a, this very magical symbiosis. Uh, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a biologist by education. So, um, <clears throat> How do communities co cooperate without budgets or bosses? Now, um, for me, a big transformational book for that was uh, Debt. Um, it's um, by David Graeber. Uh, people call him the anthropology, wait, the, um, uh, the anarchic anthropologist. Um, he says that you shouldn't call him that, but I still call him that. Um, it's interesting uh, because he, he's been looking at um, uh, cultures before money, communities that didn't have money, and that introduced, uh, like, and how do they talk about uh, interactions with people? Because um, what he found out that there's this economical founding myth. Uh, you know, imagine a world where I have cows, you've got chickens, and you know, we can't really exchange. How how are we going to do that? Like, you have to give me like ten chickens, and I or I give you half a cow, and that doesn't work, right? And he's like, no, no, no that's that's you know, that's crap. People don't do that. They just give to each other. If you have a small tribe, uh, people just you know, when you need something, I'm going to give you. When I need, I'm going to get something. If there's someone who's always taking and never giving back, they get banned out of the village. And um, so, what what he what I real what I learned from that is that there's this assumption that we're making about society that it is only possible if it's based on transactions and transactional relationships. That is fundamentally. Um, to some extent flawed. Like, yes, I think it's a great, it's been a great model to scale society uh, because without transactions, you're kind of stuck in a small, small village and you can't really collaborate with people because if there's bad actors, it doesn't work. Without transactions, you wouldn't have kids. Um, I think that's another talk, uh, but uh, um, <laughs> But I think um, my theory is, and this is kind of a big theory, but my theory is that we need a new technology f to help us collaborate at scale that is non-transactional. Like uh, the monetary system and the monetary way of cooperating should remain, like it's good, it's great for creating freedom, but right now it's also damaging us and it's, it's eroding our social capital in all our societies. Um, today, even communication has become transactional. Somebody's making money on what you're saying to your friends and family, and, and that is actually destroying our, our civil society. Um, and I think, I think it's the power of technology that is driving, driven too far in uh, making all our interactions transactional. I think that we need something to balance that. I don't know what it is, I have some ideas, but it's um, uh, one of the theories. But guess what? We've been doing this in Drupal, right? The magic of Drupal is that it's not transactional. The magic of community is that people just give, I think. But, but there's a reason for that. Oh yeah, there's always reasons. And, I, and those reasons are transactional. Um, I, I give and I get back way more yeah. than I give yeah. and that drives my career, yeah. which means I get money, which means I can have a nice house yes. and I can pay for my kids' clothes and all that good stuff. So. But, there, there is definitely a, a, yeah. uh, a, a uh, um, ex, uh, there's an external, there's an extrinsic, but I think um, I have, I don't have that in this slide act, but I call this um, quantum thinking, mm -hmm. is that you have to have both at the same time. So you can't have transactional or fully like altruistic. Fully altruistic gets exploited and the people that are preaching the most about altruism are typically psychopaths. Um, <laughs> so, you know. Glad to know I'm not a psychopath. <laughs> right? Like, if somebody is like, oh, you should just give, and it's normal that you're giving, and trust me, these are nom normally signals of be careful. Um, but, um, so I think what, what we need is that we need, to we need both. We need, uh, uh, I call it quantum thinking, where you can have both models at the same time, 
so that you can have the freedom that money gives you and that transactions give you, but you can also have the social capital that um, uh, build, building up of relationships gives you. And I think the danger is when we drive everything towards transactions because that's the only thing we understand. Uh, because we are, uh, are, we're so much steeped into it that we don't, we don't realize what we have. Like, when, like for example, in your family, when you have kids, please don't pay them for doing housework. It's a really bad idea. Because you, you need that uh, collective vision of the family as a counterweight. When, you, when, you, when you're being paid for everything you do, you are losing a lot of meaning, a lot of motivation. Um, and it's, it's true, we need payments because else we can't survive, but we need both, I think. I think that a lot of the loneliness and a lot of the psychological problems we're seeing in society today are driven by, by this transact, transactionalification of everything. Um, so yes, definitely. Uh, um, communication. This was a really big one for me, is this polarization in, in conflict. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to go too much in politics, but, uh, <laughs> um, but for me, transformational books were these two. Um, the first one was The Anatomy of Peace, that helped me understand the problem. It's kind of like the why. And the other one was Nonviolent Communication, was a, a solution to the problem. Um, Anatomy of Peace is basically, uh, this was transformational for me for a lot of my relationships. I'm an um, I'm op like eternal optimist, and uh, I thought that was a good thing until I realized that I was forcing people around me to be more pessimistic. Because when you have a relationship, you're, you know, the magic happens in the middle. And when one person is going one side, the other person has to go the other side to keep it in the middle. Um, so, and and, and um, in this book, they talk about demon dialogues, which is basically about, um, they, they talk, like also Dr. Seuss talks about this, uh, if, you, if you want another book about that. Uh, this more personal relationships. Um, and Anatomy of Peace is more about, um, um, you know, in society. But, um, uh, this idea that, like, if you with your significant other, this it's such a, um, uh, yeah, it, it's such a. Um, I'm looking for the word, but you, you know this, right? The sloof we call it in Dutch, we call it the sloof, the the um, husband and wife, and there's such caricatures because the one is doing something so extreme that the other has to do the other thing so extreme, like. One person completely without power, the other with all the power. That kind of dynamics. That's a, what I call a demon dialogue. And the, uh, in the book, they explain how you get into that. Where, uh, when you have, especially in, with your significant other, um, you have this bond together. And when somebody is doing something irrational, they're basically asking, like, "Hey, do we still have this bond?" And then if you react badly on that, then you're basically saying, like, "Actually, no, we don't have this bond." And then you get this conflict spiral. That's, that goes out of control. The other book, Nonviolent Communication, talks about a model for, for dealing with that. And it's um, basically, uh, when you hear people talk, they will often start from uh, personification. You are always like this, or you're such a blah, blah, blah. And, um, and that's really bad, because you're, you're forcing them to be one thing, and people are not one thing. People are quantum. They're multiple things at the same time. Um, and the other thing is, the, uh, I think we should do X, Y, Z. Like, I've got my strategy, and now I'm going to keep talking about my strategy, and I'm not going to listen to you, even if you have another, you know. So those are two really bad anti-patterns that you shouldn't use. The good patterns is, you know, you say something, the other person like comes back, slams, like you start feeling a conflict, you listen to them and you say, oh, well, when you say that, I feel like this, uh, I think that this is what you need, this is what I need, is there some way, well, first, I think this is what you need, is that correct? Yes or no, I, actually, my needs are different. Then you come back with, this is what I need. Can we find a solution together that fulfills both our needs so that we don't try to shoehorn the other person's needs in, in our strategy that we've come up in a, in a split second 
that probably is completely wrong, and that we 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 try to listen to the other and uh, and come to a conclusion. And I think the the key is that it, when you focus around feelings and needs instead of image and strategy and I identity, um, then it, it conflict is actually a good thing. Uh, I'm a massive conflict avoider. I'm a yes person. I really don't like conflict, uh, or I used to not like conflict, and I've learned to love conflict because every time I have a conflict, I learn. And um, and by avoiding conflict, I was actually destroying my relationships, um, little by little, yeah. one kumbaya at a time. <laughs> uh, language. Can you spot what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> um, how can you recognize good communities? And this is also company communities, company culture is similar. Um, I love this book, Tribal Leadership, which was about um, um, this thing, which is a model for how people talk and what it means about the culture of that organization or that group or whatever. It's this idea that, um, say, when, peop when people start, when people say, like, you know, the world sucks, um, they're in a really bad place. It's really hard to work with them. Um, then they, like, they, they move up a little bit. They get into, my life sucks, but theirs doesn't. Um, then they go, I'm great, but you're not. We are great, but they are not. And then there's the world is great, and it's just awesome. What was really interesting in this is recognizing that when you have people saying, I'm great, that it means there's a bunch of people that are hearing, I'm not. When, uh, like, I, I, I love looking for this in, in uh, events, when you have presenters that are trying to pretend that they're so much better than everybody else, and like, you have to work with me because I'm so much smarter than you. Um, basically, they're saying, I'm great and you're not. They're terrible people to work with. Uh, a lot of cultures are like that. Uh, often in, in hierarchical systems, it's, it's very much like that. Um, you can look at, as a leader in your organization, you, you try to go up. <laughs> so, we are great is easier. The world is great is hard because you need a lot of money. <laughs> if you have enough money, you can get into the world is great. Um, but... Um, I think what's interesting is that language is a, an indicator of culture. Uh, so like looking for this language patterns in your different cultural environments, and like and when people are switching between them and, and how they're switching between them can be an indicator of this, of, of something that's going wrong. And then also like that in the most, com in the most performant cultures, competition goes away. I think that's amazing. We have this idea of the world as this Darwinistic, um, you know, survival of the fittest. But it's not true. It's not survival of the fittest. It's survival of the sufficiently fit. And, um, and for, for a very long time, that was how the Drupal community operated. It's been, there's been some shifts, I feel. Um, and like, well, we're, we're specialized and we're in our own little niche so that we don't have to compete. I don't like competition, you know, yes person. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah. Value. Um, I was looking for a good question to follow the pattern, kind of weird question, but if you look at software projects, <clears throat> um, it's hard to find the bottleneck because it's kind of shifting. And uh, the, um, I read this book, which is about um, yeah, a project to product. Uh, I think the, the core thing I got it from it was this, which is we used to be in uh, running organizations as singular value flows, like value streams that were linear, and now we're running value networks that are, um, you know, they can root around problems, and um, and it's also a lot more adaptive. And like, and probably we should be looking. F you need some linearity to get efficiency, but you should also have this network around it uh, in your organizational design. Um, so no, digital businesses are value networks rather than value streams. It's interesting because it shows you if you start looking at a business and you see it's a stream, then probably they're still in the old paradigm. 
uh, you start like good businesses are are more adaptive and are acting more like uh, networks. Last one, uh, constraints. Um, this is a really hard concept. <laughs> um, I read uh, this book. Um, I spent like a whole summer trying to understand it. Um, I think the key question is this: is like how do self-organizing systems protect themselves against failure? How does life survive? Like how do we how do we keep going? And um, the this first book, this is the one that opened this for me. Um, uh, Jeremy Sherman, Leader Ghost and Machine, is quite accessible. Um, it's uh, it's based on the work of Terence Deacon, and it's a concept of um, he, he basically talks about how do you get from non-living matter to living systems, and um, how does that work, and how do and and he's talking about constraints as a way that that works. What I mean with constraints, you saw the mug. Um, we all recognize this, and we know what it does. It's an affordance. It's an affordance. It's a capability for holding liquids. And it doesn't matter what material it's made of, and it's not constraining the liquids in the exact same place. The liquid does not have to become a crystal to stay in place, because there's an open affordance that allows the liquids to go, and as long as you, know, you don't do crazy things, it stays, put, it stays put. That's how life works. It's also how I think you build really good adaptive organizations. Is there are constraints that protect the system, but the people inside are free. They're free to move and to you know, adjust, and they're free to learn and to, um, uh, to, um, to adjust to whatever is happening on the outside. But there's a lot more to it. Um, you can build affordance platforms, uh, or like you know, you can put multiple affordances like this together. Uh, like engine is, an, is a good affordance. There's a lot of constraints that together create a capability that you can reuse. Um, it's too much for this talk, but I think digital transformation is about affordance platforms. Um, and I'll, I'll yeah, I, I'm, I'm still working on that. But um, the the key thing is that. Um, cells and, and biological systems, they um, have these constraints that help to catalyze trans transformations, and they have this multicellular modus where individual units can fail. And it's this model of hyper-constraints organelles like mitochondria, where all the energy is being produced, combined with the cell where there's a lot less constraints where you can store lots and lots of lots of DNA because you have so much more energy. That combination is, I think, a really interesting model to look at uh, for, for the way we structure businesses and, and society probably also. With, you know, using machines for the hyper-constraints parts and the humans to create the adaptivity that allows us to be more uh, adaptive to whatever we're doing. So, like, don't force people into straitjackets. You know, you can make them part of a process uh, but help, let them rotate out uh, so that they can be adaptive because that's what we normally would like to do. Um, so I think the, the key here is living systems are just enough constraints with fallible substructures to gain uh, immortality. Uh, there's a lot more, but that's, that's a core concept. Conclusion, there's another way to grow systems. There's another way to grow businesses uh, using constraints and affordances. Um, I'll share the slides afterwards also. So that we can go from complicated machines to complex organisms that are much more adaptive, uh, that are you know, uh, learning in communities and, and things like that. And uh, as a result, this can help us build better businesses and communities, um, also better software, um, all healthier relationships. I think we are only just starting to understand how biology actually works. Like, it's probably going to be very hard to really understand everything because it's emergent and a lot of the, the behavior is, is just not deterministic. Um, but if we better understand it, uh, if we better understand systems thinking, if we understand how communities work, how ecosystems work, we can avoid some of the mistakes that will destroy our ecosystems, like what we're doing with the planet, um, that can you know, really 
destroy our communities also if we if we don't watch out what we're doing like if we make everything extrinsic we, we lose uh, a lot of that internal motivation I'd like to end with some more books um, if you like a really poetic book um, I love the simpler way uh, it's uh, available on audible it's like uh, listening to poetry but it talks about all this systems way of thinking and it's it's there's a lot of different concepts that are being shown and explained um, and it's a bit of meandering is beautiful um, I really loved it um, the, um, the that one is about how to use systems thinking to change organizations the middle one and the last one is another one by Margaret Wheatley which is um, uh, yeah, le leadership and, and how to how to do that with systems thinking um, thank you, and I have I have some more because I've added. I wasn't sure if I would have time. So, how do you do this? How do you use complexity? How do you become more complex? I think the key is emergence behavior. Uh, like this is um, stick merging. This is what ants do. Um, so it's like it's about becoming a complex adaptive system. And this is from a, a book that I mentioned earlier uh, about understanding complexity. There's four. Um, parameters that you can tweak to uh, tune complexity, which is really interesting, is the interconnection, interdependence, diversity, and adaptivity. You cannot go, you, this should not be zero, and there should not be infinity. If there's too much of either of them, it's no longer complex. So I think there's some way to tune complexity by tuning these things, by tuning, maybe even pruning relationships, or by creating boundaries by, um, there's, there's something here. There's a, a science for complex adaptive behavior that could help us to create more resilient systems and more resilient communities. Um, and yeah, uh, we do dev portals and I think, this, I think you, you, maybe there's a way to tune uh, that in organizations. But um, there's a bunch of uh, references, but um, yeah, that, these are like the images that I'm using. On that note, that's all. Are there any questions that you have? <laughs> we have a few a few minutes. Yeah? No. Yeah, I'll repeat. come repeat it, yeah. yeah, okay. uh, yeah I have a question about, um, yeah, you speak about in quite abstract terms about this organization. Yes. Organization. I come from, let's say, a government perspective. Yeah. Changed the organization of culture in the past years. Not successful, not so successful. So I was wondering if you could make a recommendation <coughs> practically what organizations could do as a first yeah. step to become this adaptive organization. Yeah. And if I may ask a, a related question at the same time, you also mentioned that, uh, in, that the most performing cultures uh, are not competitive. Yeah. Explain a bit more. Yeah, sure. So, so I think uh, the first question was, how do you become complex? Like, what's the first step to becoming complex adaptive system? What can an organization do? Yeah, what's, what organizations can do? I think one interesting area is um, something called, in, like, depends on how, how big you are. If you're enterprise big, a really good place to start is something called inner sourcing, which is using open source methodologies and tools to start opening up internally. So that instead of having silos, you start creating cross-linking between, uh, between the different compartments in your organization. I, I talked about those four parameters. Uh, uh, inner sourcing helps you with interconnection, interconnectedness and interdependence and in adaptivity to some extent. Because what you're doing is you're saying, I've got uh, a piece of software that I'm producing for our organization and you're my customer, you're my internal customer, you're using this piece of software. If you need something to be changed in that piece of software, just do a pull request and we'll, we'll, accept, we'll review it and we'll accept it. And, um, and that way you can start cross-linking and create more interconnections and that could be a first step. There's something else about uh, boundaries and signals. Uh, I think APIs are a good way to uh, start um, uh, reorganizing your your um, your signal infrastructure so that you can create better boundary systems internally. Um, I don't know yet exactly what that means. This is very 
theoretical, I'm approaching this from a philosophical perspective. Uh, in the practice, we help companies with APIs and, and, and with API documentation and with portals that help them with this stuff. I don't talk about that because it's a, it's a, very, it's a different thing. But, um, um, but I think that some part of that is there also. It's like, uh, I think software is transforming the way we, we communicate internally, like things like Slack, for example, using or, or an open source uh, alternative. Um, using uh, like instant communication to create more interconnection. But be careful because if there's too much interconnection and interdependence, it also fails, right? So it's, um, but I think that's, that's probably a good place to start. Uh, and then doing that with a, what I call a bright spots and FOMO methodology, where you start creating a bright spot. So you find somebody in your organization that you're like, you're going to be my champion, and I'm going to help you to, to make this change towards more openness. And then you use them as an example to drive uh, fear of missing out to bring other people on board. Your other question was um, uh, this competitiveness. Yeah. So th this book, if you read the book about... Um, uh, yeah, the book that I sh said when, uh, when I talked about that. Um, they thought that the best cultures were the ones where they said, we are great. And then they found some cultures where, like a startup was doing so groundbreaking stuff, or like a company was doing such groundbreaking stuff, that they were basically just forgetting about competition. And they were so far ahead of everybody that they didn't have to worry about who are we competing with, and are they going to steal our secrets, and, and they're just like, we're great! Or, sorry, we, look, the world is awesome, and we're doing this awesome stuff for the world. And I think this is how we've been in, as a Drupal community for a very long time. We were just, we're doing this awesome stuff, and, and everybody just come and join. Like, you know, we're, we're not competing here. And, and I think um, when we start, like, we've had a scarcity moment in the community, which triggered a lot more competition. And I think this has been, for, for me at least, this was something that was something that uh, really hurt the community, uh, at least what I'm, I can see. Um, so I think thinking about uh, how can you how can you go beyond competition? I, I think that's the uh, that's the idea. Okay. I have more theories. I have like a theory about creating a value graph. Um, as a way to communicate about what we think is valuable as an organization, um, uh, so that you can move beyond transactions as a way to communicate what is valuable. Right now, you need someone to say, I'm gonna pay you for whatever you're gonna do to be able to say this is a valuable thing. And because of that, a lot of very valuable things like having kids and teaching people and all of these things that are really, really important, they're treated as non-valuable because they're not scarce. Our current way of valuing things is it has to be valuable and it has to be scarce. Uh, and if it's not scarce, it's no longer valuable. And that's crazy. Um, so I have, I have ideas about how we could create a value communication infrastructure to communicate about value. So we can uh, have a collective understanding of what we value as an organization or as a society uh, and use that to drive our behavior collectively. But it's still, I don't know exactly how it looks like. It's still um, early, early days. But that value system is all about control, right? When you, when you, set, up a, a, when you set up the notion that it has to be scarce yeah. uh, in order to have value, yeah. you're setting up a, a situation where, where you can build control structures yeah. around who has that scarce whatever it is. Yeah. Whether it's whether it's water or whether it's uh, yeah. whether it's uh, uh, you know, anything else, right? So we, we have to we have to yeah, stop right. Point. Yeah, I'll I'll, um, I'll we can move the discussion further outside if you if you want to uh, follow up a little bit. Uh, thank you very much for. for listening.